Hi folks, welcome back to the Cannabis Corner. I'm your host, Kerry Burns. In the beginning of the 1920s, we had a Protestant group, religious sect in this country, that was trying to control alcohol and try to get people to quit drinking and all that. And they've been pushing for years to get the government to pass prohibition and make alcohol illegal. Well, finally, with the passage of the Volstead Act, they were able to get this done. And of course, there, the similarities of what happened then versus when the Controlled Substance Act was passed by Nixon and his cronies in the early 70s here in this country are very similar, and the events going on were very similar. Back in the 20s, of course, the very first thing that the prohibition did was give rise to all of the beer gangs and the Al Capones and stuff like that. And you took, basically took a bunch of street thugs that uh, were, were stealing and doing things like that, and uh, they went into the liquor business, not only in the bootlegging part of it, but they, they, were, they were actually making the uh, liquor, uh, bringing it from ship, rum ships that were coming from Jamaica and the, different, and the West Indies and places like that. And you basically took these uh, street thugs and made millionaires out of them because the liquor business was quite prolific. And uh, the whole time during this period, uh, from the very beginning of the Volstead Act when it passed and all, people were just took it like a joke. They couldn't even believe that somebody was going to actually try to uh, to uh, make this illegal. Now they and there were there were a lot of people that, that thought it was a joke. And then when they when the federal government had all of its uh, agents, pretty much like the drug enforcement agents today, they uh, started busting all the steals. They started uh, making raids on all the speakeasies and and uh, the rum runners and, and a lot of the bootleggers and stuff like that. And uh, it's pretty much what happened today. So we, we, met, we took a substance that was legal, alcohol, and we had the uh, Protestant groups in this country, the religious sects, they put their weight of their support and all on the government, and the government passed the Volstead Act. It was the same thing in 1970 with the uh, Controlled Substance Act, which made cannabis illegal in this country and, and other drugs and, and brought about the drug scheduling. Long, uh, there were, I mean, when you, when you look back in history, and, and there's a, this beautiful documentary by Ken Burns on uh, Prohibition, uh, details this in a three-part series, and I recommend all of you to, to be sure and watch that and all, but... When you look at the history of what was going on and what our government was doing and what the people were having to go through and all, it's no different than what we've seen with this war on drugs and the Drug Enforcement Agency. All of the, I mean, you can almost overlap the piece of history that was going on then with what's going on today. And you had just thousands and thousands of people that were being sent to jail because they were caught with liquor. And the, most of the people back then thought it was their right to, you know, to use alcohol. This was a matter of personal choice. They didn't care what the religious groups thought and all. I mean, most of those people were so far over the edge anyway that they, they really thought they were a, bit, a little bit beyond ridiculous to even try to tell somebody what they could do. And when the Controlled Substance Act came out in 1970, the hippie movement, the people back then that were using cannabis and all, they, 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 we were expressing the same sentiments. We knew that this was wrong. It was the government trying to tell people what to do and it just, it wasn't going to fly. But, uh, and when Hoover uh, went into office and all, he said that he was gonna take a look at alcohol and he, he set up a commission to look at it and all and their recommendation was that they should uh, reveal, repeal the Volstead Act and make alcohol legal again. Of course, Hoover, he did exactly the opposite of what the people wanted. And he, pretty much all the people back then thought that Hoover was disconnected from what the public wanted. And that was pretty much the truth. And even after the study recommended that alcohol become legal and, and put an end to these gangs and put an end to the murders, I mean, there were up, up to 150 to 200 of these mobsters that were being killed every month just to see who could control the beer rackets and all. And we're seeing that in the south of the border with the cartels in Mexico and all of the people that are being murdered down there. It's all about who can control the cannabis business in the United States. It's a very, very, very similar situation. Well, Hoover just ignored the one of the people. And even after the commission that he appointed to look at alcohol said, hey, you know, we do need to turn this around and repeal the Volstead Act. Well, he ignored it. And... Uh, it's very similar to what Nixon did with the Shaver Commission. He appointed, Nixon appointed the Shaver Commission to like, take a look at cannabis. And when they, they did a one-year study on it and came back and said that cannabis should be decriminalized, that it should not fall under a Controlled Substance Act, 
people should be allowed to grow and smoke and possess cannabis without any repercussions from the law. What did they do? They ignored the want of the people. Same thing again. And they passed the Controlled Substance Act. And not only, it was like a kick in the teeth with Nixon. I mean, he not only ignored the, his own commission, the Shaver Commission, which recommended legalization, but he also put cannabis in the worst, the most strictest of the controlled substances, five categories, which was, you know, just saying, hi, I'll show y'all. And, you know, Nixon sort of used the, his, his power as president to uh, circumvent really what was constitutionally right. And there was no different back in prohibition. And when you look at Al Capone and the, the rich, riches that him and his gangs made and all the rivals he had, I mean, there were, there were so many different factions fighting for control of the liquor sales in, in all the major cities and, and the com small communities alike. And it, they used their muscle. They didn't mind killing. And this is what we're seeing down in Mexico. The cartels don't care. As long as they're able to get the competition out of the way or anybody that interferes with their business, they're going to murder them. And they, they could have taken their lessons back from the Prohibition days because this is exactly what was going on then. Along the uh, early 1930s, when uh, Roosevelt, uh, he was a Democrat, of course, Hoover was the Republican for the, the presidential election. The uh, Pauline Sabin, uh, she was this uh, New York ph uh, philanthropist. She was a very, from a very wealthy family. She had wealth on both sides of her family. She had uncles that were rich. Uh, they were they, they were just they were in the banking business. They were in real estate. They they were in the shipping business. I mean, they had a lot of money. Now her particular herself, she wasn't really one that uh, you know wanted to favor legalizing alcohol because she was just a drunk and wanted to get, to get drunk and all. But she could see the problems of what was going on. She could see all the violence and having alcohol illegal. What that what that brought about and all the shootings and. And the fact that they were trying to tell people that they couldn't do what they wanted to do. And this being the United States of America and freedom of choice and all, uh, she decided to get behind uh, Roosevelt and she nominated him for, for uh, she got behind him on his nomination. And one of the things that Roosevelt was running on was that he was going to turn the Volstead Act around. And uh, Pauline Sabin formed the Women's Organization for National Prohibition Repeal at one, at one time during their organization, they had over a million and a half members around the entire country. And their main focus was to get the Volstead Act repealed, to make alcohol legal again, because there were people dying from bogus alcohol, the, the wood alcohol they were cutting it with, trying to you know raise their profits and stuff. Same thing that's going on today. The cartels, they, they interfere with the uh, cannabis. They cut it. They dump a bunch of trash in it, seeds, things like that, to make the weight higher so they can make more profits. Same things were going on back then. Anytime you take a substance and you make it illegal and all, you're going to have this, uh, this type of activity. And all, of it, all it does is bring out the criminal elements. And, and there were people back then that could see that with alcohol. And it just seems like that our country didn't learn the lesson once we made alcohol legal. In uh, December of, the, of 1933, with the passage of the 21st Amendment, it pretty much voided the 18th Amendment. Uh, Senator J.J. Uh, Blaine was one of the front runners of that and all. And you had uh, representatives, li senators like uh, Herman that uh, he wanted to, to do it because of the revenues that, were, that it could generate. I mean, we were talking about, you know, 1929 in the fall of 1929, the stock market crashed and things got really bad for people. The soup lines started forming. People had it tough. and. For the next few years, it got even worse. I mean, even in the spring of 1931, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of what's going on today with the real estate market and all the people that are getting upside down on their mortgages. Back then, over a thousand homes a day were being lost from the same type of activity because the stock market had crashed. There were no jobs anywhere. People were just starving to death and all that. And uh, some of the senators there said, hey, you know, if we if we made alcohol legal again and tax it and all, this would generate $500 million in tax revenue. And we could probably put some of the people back to work by opening the refineries and, and take this away from the illegal market and all. And it's exactly what's going on today with the Controlled Substance Act and the War on Drugs, the Drug Enforcement Agency. All they're doing, they're causing trouble. And they're, they've brought about the rise of all these gangs, not only the, 
Mexican cartels in Mexico, but also all the, the street gangs in the United States. All of them operate. The reason they're so prolific and their numbers are so good and they can get away with what they're doing is because they control the drug activity out there on the streets. And this is just wrong. And not to mention all the innocent people that are arrested just for possession charges for cannabis that have had their lives ruined. I mean, since the Controlled Substance Act was passed, we've locked up over 40 million people just for possession of cannabis. And it's still going on today. In fact, today it's even worse than it's ever been in our, in our time. Uh, New York State alone, is, uh, they're, they're arresting 50,000 people a month up there for just possession charges of cannabis. And this is absolutely insane that we ruin Americans' lives because they want to take the freedom of choice that they possess with their constitution and use cannabis or whatever drug they want to use for that matter. But certainly one like cannabis that has never killed anybody has never caused anybody to go to the hospital for an overdose or anything like that. This is just certainly wrong. And the fact that we stand back and allow a cartel in Mexico, many cartels for that matter, you know, murder innocent people just so they can control the marijuana market here in the United States is, is really wrong. And there are people like Pauline Sabin back in the early 1930s when she formed her organization, women's organization and all, she was a very smart lady. She could see what was going on. She knew that, that the reason that all the killings were happening and all the mobsters were shooting each, gunning people down, the Valentine's Day massacre, different things like that, all that was occurring because alcohol was illegal. And you had all of these people, all these federal agents and stuff, their jobs were to go around and bust the steels up, arrest people, try to shut down the speakeasies. They said for every one they closed, two more would open up. And so there was really no way that they could control anything back then and pretty much made a joke of, of the Volstead Act and the prohibition. But it continued, you know, for 13 years in this country until December 5th, 1933, when the 21st Amendment pretty much did away with the Volstead Act and the 18th Amendment. Of course, it was later in the spring, by April 7th, it was legal to buy a bottle of beer in the United States again. And we had gone through a period of around 13 years in this country that it was illegal and countless deaths, countless lives ruined, people dying from bogus alcohol, all that. And it's, it's very similar to what happens today. And what we need today, we need a modern day Pauline Sabin. We need one of the, the philanthropists, one of the rich people out there, somebody that has power with the government, somebody that can see what's going on and look past all this, you know, crap, if you will, because that's really what it is. And we need somebody like that to step forward and take the reins and, and do away with the Controlled Substance Act and do away with this drug war and do away with the Drug Enforcement Agency. They have done nothing but cost this country tax dollars. We've kept the hemp industry from happening again. We completely did away with that after World War II. And we proved again, even though uh, the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937 had been passed for around six years, we brought the hemp industry back because we couldn't get hemp during the war because the Japanese had shut off the supply from the Philippines, we proved that the industry could easily be set back up again and, and with not a lot of money. And it could be done again today. And the fact that we stand by as citizens, it doesn't matter if people smoke cannabis. It's never hurt anybody. It's never sent anybody to the hospital. Nobody's ever died from an overdose from it. Less people die from the illicit drugs, heroin, cocaine, methamphetamine, crack, than die from just prescription Oxycontin alone. Just that one drug, that one prescription drug, kills up to three times more than all of the illicit ones combined. How do we stand by and continue to allow this drug enforcement agency to operate like they're doing? They're, they're the equivalent of one of these Capone gangs. They're the equivalent of the cartels, except the only difference is they have the power of the government working for them. And the people, over 50% of the people polled in all the latest polls believe that cannabis should be made legal in this country. Did the government listen to it? Did the government leave the people alone at the, at the uh, dispensaries in California once the law was passed in California that they could actually have the medical marijuana and start supplying these people? The, the prohibition ended somewhat on a small scale out there. Did the, the DEA leave them alone? No, they didn't. So really, we've got a government that operates like the cartels. They don't care what the people want. They have absolutely no desire at all. And I personally believe that once the uh, 18th Amendment was repealed and, and beer and alcohol was made legal again, 
all of these federal agents and these people in the federal government that were part of the prohibition, they didn't have anything to do. And I really do believe that the reason that the, the Marijuana Tax Act passed in 1937, even though there were a lot of reasons that were going on and a lot of, a lot of uh, crooked businessmen and stuff that stood to gain by making hemp illegal, I do believe that a big part of it was that the government needed another prohibition. They needed another outlet to put all these agents to work. They had them all, you know, what were they going to do with them? You know, they weren't going to just fire them and all. They were working for the federal government. I mean, you ever heard anybody getting fired from the federal government? Seriously? I mean, that's really what was going on. So this was their new prohibition. And they started in around 1935 making plans to make hemp illegal in 1937. And what happened after it was made illegal? They started putting all the agents back to work, state to state, went state to state, ratified all the, the marijuana laws and stuff, and started putting people in jail. And it wasn't until Nixon came along, actually when the uh, 1961 Singles Narcotics International Treaty passed, of course the United States was a member of that, and there were 90 other countries too that were part of that, and about 15 of them we've been to war with or had some type of skirmish with since then, and even currently we're, we're, we're in skirmish in Afghanistan and Pakistan and, and somewhat in Iraq, and all of those were members of this international drug control policy and all. And the, you know our enemies basically, but we decided to you know stay on board with that. And the United States, in in answer to that, they passed the Controlled Substance Act, and everything that's occurred since then duplicates what happened during the Prohibition days. We have we have uh, narcotics that are being brought across the border from Mexico by the cartels: cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, crack, all of those, and they're being cut with illicit substances, dangerous substances. The cannabis in Mexico is being sprayed with with chemicals, they're, I wouldn't doubt that they're crushing up and, and hydrating uh, different pharmaceuticals and spraying it on the cannabis to try to make it seem like it's stronger because they're trying to compete with the, the stronger cannabis varieties that are being grown here in the United States by independent growers and stuff. And so what we did, we traded one prohibition for another. And it took 13 years for the first one to uh, finally get rid of during, from 1920 to 1933, they finally got rid of the alcohol prohibition but here we are, we're going on seven decades in this country that we've had cannabis illegal. And it's time to turn this around. It's time for, for our modern day Pauline Saban to step forward. It's time for the people to wake up. It's time for us to vote this government out of office. That's the beauty of it. We can give them all a pink slip once the elections come around. And my advice is when you go to the polls to vote, if there's an incumbent on the ticket, vote him out because he's part of the problem. Vote him out. You have the power to do that. And until we start doing that, we're not going to be able to change these things that have been plaguing this country for a long, long time. And the Controlled Substance Act, the Drug Enforcement Agency, and all of the power of the government and everything they're doing, these are what are causing our problems today in America. It's what's making it so tough for people to get a job. It's what's making it tough for people to, to stay out of jail. I mean, you've got innocent lives just because they choose to use a safe herb that has never killed anyone, never sent anybody to the hospital, way safer than anything out there that's legal, and yet we have this strong arm of the law that won't let up. They won't, I mean, they absolutely today are just as strong about arresting somebody for pot as they were when they passed the Controlled Substance Act back in 1970, and this is wrong. And we as a people, we're better than that. This is the United States of America. Our Constitution grants us freedom of choice. It grants us rights that we're born with. And these certainly don't fit the bill. And the worst part about it all, you, wanna, you want jobs, you want things to start happening in America, you want to boost the economy, the hemp industry is the answer. And as long as we have this going, as long as we have the stupidity of going in our government, people are going to be oppressed and our economy is going to stink there aren't going to be any jobs available and all. And this is something, this is a homegrown industry that this country was founded on from the early colonial days. And we need to bring it back. So let's, let's have a modern day Pauline Saban step forward. Let's get some leaders up there, somebody that, out there that has money that somebody respects. We need you to step forward and take the reins and do just as Pauline Saban did and put the right people in government that are going to change this. Because until we do that, we're screwed. And if you want a job, you want a good economy and all, 
Let's get the hemp industry going.